My name is Nick Hardwick. I am the research associate from Digital Frontiers Institute. If uh, any of you have attended a webinar hosted by the FI before, you'll know that Sarah Corley usually runs these. She's currently away on, on leave, so I'll be running this in her place. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things that you need to be aware of. This webinar is being recorded, so please be aware of that um, when you're asking the questions or interacting with other panelists and, and participants. You can find the recording on the Digital Frontiers Institute website once it has been uploaded. Uh, and those of you that have signed up for this will receive an email linking that recording so that you can watch it or show it to any of your colleagues or peers. Um, just a little bit of an introduction. Uh, I've got Thea Anderson with me, who's the director, director in Omidia, uh, and she's joined by her colleague, Savashish, who is an investment principal based in Bangal Bangalore. And uh, today we'll be looking at a very interesting topic in terms of exploring appropriate uses of digital ID and the good ID movement. Um, so the way that this is going to work is that we're going to spend about 20 to 30 minutes discussing the topic. And then from there, we'll have a time for Q&A. So if you've got questions or anything you would like to say, please use the Q&A function or the chat box. And I will relay those questions to our panelists and the latter half of the webinar will be dealing with that. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our panelists. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Great, thanks, Nick. Yeah, again, so I'm Thea Anderson and I'm with my colleague Subhashish uh, Bandra and we were with the MIDIAR network. So on this webinar, we're going to do a couple things. So one, I'll start off with just initial framing of how we uh, talk and discuss digital identity and our framing that we use, which we call good ID. Then we'll move into a discussion around uh, research we're currently doing right now in Brazil, Kenya, and and then we'll move into some of the emerging business models that we're looking at as, as part of our investment portfolio. And then what we really do is hope to spend um, the bulk of the time really learning, I mean, certainly answering any questions, but also learning what others are doing um, in the sector and any plans that you have for the future. So first, for those of the few that are new to Omidyar Network, we're a philanthropic investment firm founded by Pierre and Pam Omidyar, who founded eBay. We focus on uh, building equitable economies and the team that we're on focuses on promoting uh, beneficial technology globally. And we specifically look at digital identity, um, including data protection and, and, and privacy. We do investments in mission aligned commercial startups, and we do quite a bit of work in looking at how do we help build out the ID ecosystem. So that's in data-driven research, um, policy and advocacy, uh, looking at building open standards and open source technologies. So just for some background for when we talk about identity at a mid-year network, really talking about identities and, and personal data. We group digital identities into three very interconnected categories, which is I think very similar to um, DFI's framing as well. So one is an identity uh, that's issued by an identity provider. So that could be a government ID or from a commercial actor like a, a bank or even a humanitarian organization. Uh, the second type of ID are what we call a de facto ID. So it's the data trails or the personally identifiable data that we create online. So our passwords, um, our mobile uh, phone usage. And then the third is looking at different types of self-asserted identities. So again, what I mentioned at the beginning is what we at Omidy use is, is the term good ID, is a normative framing for any digital identity system. And we use that term because what we really want to see more in the world are identities that really prioritize individual empowerment, but also ensure adequate safeguards. And so the, when we say good ID, that's an ID that's inclusive. It offers uh, personal value and empowers with privacy, security, and control. Um, it also builds trust with transparency and accountability and really seeks to address exclusion, discrimination, surveillance, and, and, and to be considered a good ID, again, really must be add real value to individuals. So as part of that, um, some of the language that we, that we tend to use is recognizing that when an ID system is designed and rolled out and managed, Sorry, I forgot to move the slide. It was rolled out and managed. Um, that can lead to you know, protection, it can lead to privacy, it can lead to security. But what we also see quite a bit is the way a system is designed can reinforce power imbalances, exclude, discriminate, and, and support surveillance. So 
for us, what we're really trying to do now is how do we look to increase uh, both the supply and demand of good ID uh, through policy, technology, and, and, and practice. And so the way we've structured good ID is we talk about trust building practices and, and the two priorities are around transparency. So that's transparency in, in how data is collected, how it's used, um, in the tendering process, for example, if it's, a, it's an issued ID, but then also making sure that there's adequate uh, public participation at every single step. And also around accountability. So before any type of ID is issued, what legal frameworks are in place, for example, for, for recourse or to understand what data has been collected, how that data will be used. And then building on, on that, we also, we prioritize uh, five features that apply to all forms of digital ID. Um, so those are privacy, uh, which we also recognize, recognize as really as a fundamental human right. Inclusive, so an ID that promotes equality and equity, uh, limit, limits the mandatory use of the ID, which is something we'll talk about in a little bit uh, about some of the research we're looking at, um, and also already has safeguards from discrimination. And then really having user value. A lot of uh, different ID systems, especially sometimes if they're issued by a government actor, they, they may potentially add value to the government, but it's not always clear what the value is to the, the individual. So that's another area we really focus on, and that includes interoperability and importability of data as well. And then again, user agency as well, um, allowing individuals to decide how they want to participate and what information they um, can share. And then really building uh, on all four of those is around security. So making sure that there's, in, there's safeguards built in, there's proper controls, that there's, there's making sure that there's no loss of data or uh, security breaches. So again, one of the things that we're really looking at is, um, so as we talk about good ID, one of the things we've been starting, especially in the past year, is really looking at what the good ID movement. And we're working with across the spectrum of different civil society actors, governments, um, other donors, and quite a bit from the, the commercial sector. So one, to generate demand for good ID. Um, so again, really building trust, trust in different ID systems. But at the same time, also uh, holding different ID issuers accountable and responsible. And, then the other flip side, really improving the supply of good ID. Um, so that again is working with different policymakers and ID issuers, but then also looking to how do we build some of the business and commercial cases for, for privacy and for user control. And so last, there was, a very, there was a very quick overview, but we can certainly discuss that more in, in the Q&A. But just for, for Midiar Network, um, I want to talk a little bit about different investments or the four categories of investments that we're going to be looking at over the next couple of years. And one of those is really catalyzing capital uh, and supporting entrepreneurs to supply this good ID technology. And that's, um, and then building on that is strengthening the, the knowledge base, the capacitor and incentives of good I, of ID issuers to deliver good ID. And at the same time, also holding them accountable, um, making sure that again, those safeguards are in place, individuals have, have recourse when they're using the ID. And then on top of that is also how are we really shaping the narrative around uh, digital identity and, and developing a really strong evidence base uh, with the data-driven research. So those are very quick overviews, but I'm going to hand it over to my colleague uh, Subhashish to talk a little bit about some of the research that, that we're, we're launching in a couple countries right now that's really looking at um, the appropriate uses of, of ID. Thank you, Tia. Um, and uh, so as Thea said, I think um, as we look at this entire good ID framing or good ID movement, uh, there are lots of questions which remain unanswered. Um, and one of the primary questions that we are grappling with uh, is what is, where should identity be used? And when we say identity here, we mean state issued identity. So, uh, or, you know, any kind of identity issued by a credible institution, be it, uh, a bank, a university, a government, etc. Uh, and all of us, I think, to an extent, have become very accustomed to uh, taking out our IDs and showing it in different places. But increasingly, as AID systems become more and more digitized, such that the digital trails they leave behind become permanent. Uh, and secondly, as more and more countries are implementing these systems, uh, and actually, as many of you might have noted in the case of Kenya, have, are mandating it uh, for a whole wide range of services. Uh, this question becomes uh, very out of, uh, you know, becomes 
really uh, important in the discussion of good ID. And therefore, what we have done is uh, we identified what are some of the possible harms from actually mandating uh, IDs in many different places. Uh, so firstly, the fact that if ID is made mandatory, you have exclusion due to services. Uh, so, for example, in the state of Aadhaar report that we funded uh, in India, which is the largest survey on uh, India's national ID system, we found about 1 to 2 percent exclusion happening due to the ID systems from food ration programs. Uh, and in a country like India, 1 to 2 percent, you're, you're possibly talking about 8 to 16 million people. So that's a very large number. So exclusion from services is one possible harm. Uh, there's obviously privacy risks that these digital trails keep getting created. And now if you can also merge those digital trails because they're linked to the same ID, uh, then that creates a privacy risk. So if I want to figure out, uh, you know, people who are dissenting, uh, where are they traveling, what services they are accessing, I can do that with ID systems. Uh, for vulnerable groups in particular, digital IDs or IDs in general create a lot of risks, uh, especially when they capture uh, either nationality or citizenship or religion uh, or caste uh, or any or race or any kind of those uh, parameters uh, that, that those become permanent identifiers. Um, and finally, that uh, overall by just mandating uh, these IDs for services, which should be the rights of citizens, uh, these uh, disempower the citizens vis-a-vis -vis other institutions, including the state. So because of all these possible harms, we believe that the mandatory uses of ID should be minimized. Uh, but we also believe that digital IDs are important for many different things. And therefore, the question we ask ourselves is, where is it OK to use IDs in, because uh, the benefits have to outweigh these risks that we have laid out? And this is still work in progress for us. Uh, so the question we ask, for example, is it okay to use digital ID to distribute a scarce resource provided by taxpayer money like food subsidies? Uh, is it okay to use digital ID to ensure participation in taxation? Uh, is it okay to use digital ID to authorize individuals to undertake tasks that require specialized skills? Uh, and we want to draw up these kind of questions, these kind of lists, grapple with what the principles are, uh, what the parameters are, what are the safeguards that are needed, etc. So to uh, answer these kind of questions, what we have done is we've provided grants to three think tanks in three different continents and three different contexts uh, to collaborate on this question. So we have provided a grant to the Center for Internet and Society in India, to uh, CIPIT in uh, Nairobi, and to ITS uh, in Brazil. Um, and over the next six months, these institutions are going to speak to each other uh, discuss uh, these parameters, these principles, etc., that help us come to some sort of uh, framing of when is it okay to use digital IDs. Uh, and we hope to actually use that as a way to uh, have some of these conversations with governments. Um, so these guys uh, released their, uh, you know, uh, they've been releasing their finding, inter interim findings and methodologies, etc., and would invite all of you uh, to, to look at some of that material online. Uh, Thea, if you could change the slide. So uh, in addition to those kind of normative framings, what we also realize is if we look at good ID, uh, just regulation or just norms alone will not be sufficient. You need something to make them real. So I was just reading earlier today that there are now over 30 ethical AI norms, but uh, without a way to actually implement it in real life, these norms remain just extremely ineffective. So one of the ways we deploy our flexible capital and dual checkbook model is we actually start investing in startups that create the technology to make good ID real. Uh, and in particular, we're looking at four kinds of startups. Uh, firstly, startups that are changing the way data is collected, stored, and processed. Uh, for example, our invested DigiMe in the UK uh, is a decentralized data vault which allows individuals to uh, store their data in a disaggregated manner on their device and personal cloud and then only share it in a very consented manner. Uh, secondly, we are looking at models of verification, ID verification, which are owned by individuals, such that both in terms of storage and in terms of verification, that process is controlled by the individual. Uh, and out there, for example, we have invested in a US-based company called Learning Machine, uh, which provides a SaaS platform for universities to issue credentials that are backed up on the blockchain, but individuals store it in their digital wallets. Uh, and then they choose when to verify it uh, and who to verify it with. Uh, 
Uh, thirdly, we are looking at regulation technology that we all have GDPR. Uh, in the last one year, uh, somewhere close to 200,000 uh, complaints have been filed under GDPR and there have been 91 fines of which 75 came just from Germany. So obviously there's a massive mismatch between the amount of the number of cases being filed and the number of cases actually being resolved. Uh, so we're looking at ways to make, to bridge that gap. Uh, so to uh, for either businesses to actually be mindful of whether their GDPR compliance or for individuals to actually be uh, able to uh, detect and then seek remedy for some of these violations. Um, so we're looking at those kind of businesses. Uh, and finally, we're looking at uh, privacy enhancing technologies, which is a broad umbrella. We're looking at ideas like homomorphic encryption. Uh, we are looking at anonymization, de-identification. So all <laughs> super heavy, uh, tech, deep technology kind of startups. Uh, but we believe that those are critical uh, for us to be actually able to create uh, a data economy where we all find, uh, where we all are safe. So the next few slides uh, are about, uh, go into a lot more detail about each of these sectors. Uh, but at this point, uh, I'm just going to skip uh, over all of these slides uh, because I'm happy to come back to this if the, any of this is of interest to uh, anyone on, on this call. Um, yeah, so, so this is uh, all that we uh, had wanted to share as a starting point. Uh, but of course, happy to answer any questions about either any of the material that we have shared here or, or any other questions that you might have either on our strategy, our investments, uh, our points of view or anything else. Okay, great. Well, we already have a couple of questions uh, that have been posted in the chat. So I'll start by reading those out. If you have any questions now, please feel free to use the chat function or the Q&A uh, and we'll get to them, uh, you know, time, time willing. First one uh, speaks about, and it's quite relevant because you did mention uh, the, the the national ID system in Kenya, and it and the question states, um, what are the panel, what, what are your thoughts around the developments around digital ID uh, that as they're taking place in Kenya, where citizens who are asking questions around the process of digitiza digitization are being denied new identi uh, identity documents outright, and uh, the new digital IDs are being required as mandatory access to public services. And what advice would you provide to the critics on how to raise their concerns with the administration? Quite a hard hitting question. Sure, why don't I go ahead and start and then Subishi, you can add in. I'm actually sitting in Nairobi right now um, with an internet is going in and out on the, at the hotel room, so I apologize. Um, yeah, I mean, we have, we have a number of concerns. We've been you know, monitoring for, for quite a while with the, the April court case, but then obviously the um, latest bill that was just dropped a, a few weeks ago. Um, I mean, I think quickly to answer your question, I mean, in going back a little bit to what, what Subashish was mentioning earlier, you know, it, we, the mandatory use is not something that we would recommend. I think the other, a lot of, there's a number of issues. So I think one, too, is that it's not only with the, the design of the features and the, the mandatory uses, it's also with the issues around there was just really a lack of public engagement and participation in understanding what is the what is going to be the use and what is going to be the value as well of this id um so yeah so a couple of things so one is that where 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 are there opportunities now for the government to to some extent take a pause and one hold many more public forums there was only a you know towards a two four hour um public forum and it was only 18 days for any public feedback um, for an ID that, you know, potentially could become the, the national ID and, and again has so many required mandatory use cases. So that's one piece is, is to take a pause. Um, two is that, you know, without a data protection law, not only passed, but actually in, in place, that's another reason, you know, we would definitely recommend that um, the government take pause as well. Subhashish, is there anything that, that you wanted to add? Yeah, so as they laid out, I think there, uh, there's, there's a couple of ways to break down this problem. So firstly, the way in which this bill and this law has been arrived at, and Thea very specifically spoke about uh, the due process that needs to be followed. Uh, there are lots of questions on the technical design and how that should be different. So for example, uh, the way the ID system in Kenya is currently in research, it's a massive database aggregating data from many different databases. And that 
uh, we believe is uh, not the right way to go about it. The mandatory uses are very high. Uh, then the the recourse and accountability, the checks and balances, we feel are uh, not uh, necessarily there. But obviously, uh, people in that geography need to uh, have the opportunity to remain far uh, deeply, far more deeply in this conversation. Um, the way I mean, drawing on some of my experiences in India about how civil society rallied and actually challenged. Uh, the ID system here and won some uh, very many great rights. Uh, I think firstly, petitioning the courts have been, has been extremely successful uh, in India. Uh, and even though the judgment, uh, like in the Indian system, came uh, usually in the Indian system came pretty late, but it actually reversed a lot of the most egregious uh, violations of this uh, of the way the ID system was being rolled out here. Uh, secondly, I think there is uh, it's, there's an important need to uh, mobilize uh, both. Uh, citizenry through uh, campaigns as well as the media that media in many of these for many of these issues does become an ally uh, and sections of the media become an ally because some of the media uh, is slightly uh, more uh, favorable to uh, to governments and these kind of authorities uh, thirdly um, uh, I think uh, you do need to uh, do a lot of research both from a quantitative, qualitative perspective, you need to bring out the stories uh, of people who are suffering due to these kind of injustices. And it, it is uh, a long journey, um, uh, but uh, it, some of these tactics have been ones uh, that I think have worked uh, in other countries. And of course, uh, the UK had a very successful movement uh, against uh, the ID system. Tunisia had a very successful movement. Uh, in Jamaica, the Supreme Court actually uh, ruled the ID system unconstitutional. So I think there have been uh, a lot of success stories uh, globally. And I think we need to draw on what are the lessons from those success stories. Great. I mean, this, kind of continuing on this train of thought, Abigail posts a question, and we're talking about success stories as well. And she asks about you know, what would you say, uh, have there been any countries that have successfully implemented this digital ID? Uh, and especially when you're, uh, we were talking about the, the Kenyan examples, you know, what and how does this help the recourse that Kenyans have? Uh, you know, what are the success stories of proper implementation? So I think a couple things. So I think first off is that, you know, when we talk about digital identity, again, it's, it's, you know, it could be these issued IDs, it's also the data trails as well. But even when we talk about um, issued ID, it's, there's, there's many types. So right now in, in Kenya, there are already many types of issued uh, digital identities. So it's not just, you know, if it's biometrics. So for example, um, if there is a smart card used, if there's a token used. Those are all different forms of, of digital identity. So one, I'm just say it's not, there's not one type of digital identity. It's a very broad term. Um, yeah, and so I think, yeah, and here, so here in Kenya, I think, I think again, going back to the, the previous question, it, there's a bit of an onus on the government as well to explain with this new ID, how is it different than, how is it going to be more beneficial than some of the other IDs that are already um, in place? more than anything else. So yeah, so yes, yeah, so in the sense that there's, I think we're around like 100 countries around the world have different types of digital identity. So it's not that they're not, it's not they're, that they're new, it's more one of the things that we're really promoting is that before they're issued is that there should be these different um, safeguards in place. And I would say that, you know, even here in, in, in Kenya before any of the different uh, IDs were digitized that, you know, there should have been the data protection um, laws not only passed, but actually put into practice. Great. Um, Rashid has a question. Rashid's from Bangladesh and he's asking specifically around financial services. Um, he says that Bangladesh has a national ID for every adult citizen and though it's a good foundation identity, how can uh, those that work in the sector and those that work in government help develop a functional ID for the financial services? So I didn't get the question completely. So what's the situation in Bangladesh? So there is uh, an ID for the financial services sector. Uh, Rashid, if you want to uh, do a little bit more explaining, feel free to drop down uh, a bit of context in the, in the chat box so we can continue the discussion. Yeah, and I would just jump in I mean, while, while he's explaining. I think, you know, a lot of times we talk about, um, you know, functional 
IDs, you know, that's often, you know, single use case IDs. And that's, that's very common, especially in the, for the financial services. But if he's talking about one that's specifically issued by, for example, you know, a state government or by a national government, um, that seems to be actually a, a trend in the sense that, you know, I know in Nigeria, one of the, the main reasons that they're moving onto different digital platforms is around financial inclusion. Right. So I think he's written there that there's an ID for all voters, for all uh, adults in the population. And the question was, of course, how do you convert this into a functional ID for other uh, sectors? So I think firstly, uh, one has to see what the technical design uh, of this ID is, whether this ID allows for real time authentication or not, and what forms of authentication does it allow for? So I suspect that because it was designed for uh, elections, it possibly does not have the full suite of authentication possibilities, including one time passwords and pins and uh, biometrics and all of that. So I think there might be some restructuring or, or rethinking around the back uh, the uh, technological back end of this infrastructure that would be required if you're thinking about converting it into a, a multi-purpose functional uh, uh, function ID. Uh, secondly, uh, once that authentication framework is in place and if there is enough trust and confidence in uh, this uh, kind of ID system, uh, then it is relatively easy uh, to actually use that identifier and use that those authentication mechanisms for different kind of use cases. So if I could take my voter ID number uh, and take it to my bank and say that, hey, there's also this way for me to authenticate that this is uh, this person, then that works. However, in those kind of situations, the recommendation always is, is to not use the single identifier, uh, either voluntarily or mandatorily. Uh, we recommend something that's called tokenization. Uh, which is that with that same backend identifier, you create multiple different tokens uh, that you then provide to different service providers such that the number that the voter, uh, the election commission has on you is different from the number that the bank has on you. Uh, and that way is that reduces the uh, uh, harms that can be caused if there are uh, privacy, while uh, their data leaks, etc. Uh, so uh, to summarize all of that, uh, firstly, look at the technical infrastructure and whether it allows for a real-time authentication. Uh, and secondly, if you're using it in different use cases, use privacy protecting uh, technological features like, uh, like tokenization and virtual IDs. Thanks, I hope that uh, answers your question, Rashid. If you've got any further questions around that, feel free to, to drop them in the, in the chat box. Um, Kambi Kaponda has a question uh, specifically relating to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And he notes that uh, there's global agreement that legal identity is a foundation for economic and social development. Can you kindly describe any reasonable, plausible cases where the extension of legal ID, or more generally, digital ID, would likely not lead to positive social or developmental outcomes? And what can be done to limit the risk of those outcomes? Um, it's quite a long question, so I'm just going to repaste it in the chat in case you need to reread it. Yeah, I mean, just quickly, I would say, um, and just to clarify on the term, so there's legal identity and there's digital identity. So a digital identity can be a form of legal identity, but a digital identity is simply an ID that's on a digital platform. So I also don't wanna make sure that the only clear those two aren't necessarily purely equated just because it's a digital ID doesn't make it a legal ID. That's all gonna depend on the type of ID. Um, but I think, I mean, in general, I think if there's an ID, so for example, that, um, isn't potentially provided to all the residents in a country that that's you know designed potentially for whether it's designed for or by default ends up being you know very excluding to different populations whether that's based on ethnicity or on religion or, or where they're living in the country that certainly would be one area that could I would definitely say does not you know live up obviously to the sustainable development goals and I think um, that could be one of the probably one of the main pieces and does that answer the question So I think, because one of the, the, the questions too, a lot of times what, when people talk about um, IDs in general, or especially around digital ID, there's a, there's a number used, the 1.1 billion of people that don't have um, an, a legal ID. And that's certainly a number that, that we agree with, though I would say a lot of, a high number of, of those are actually, you know, are, are below the age of 18. But when we actually talk about 
inclusion, we actually talk about 7 billion versus 1.1 billion, because what we would argue is that globally, a lot of ID systems are not necessarily, um, again, would live up to the, the, the good ID standards, because potentially they're an outdated ID, um, they're, they're, they could potentially lead to exclusion because, for example, they have um, ethnicity or they have religion on the ID or these different um, pieces. So there's, there's lots of different examples of, of how they can be, um, lead to exclusion. Great, thanks, Combi. If that answers your question, um, if you've got any follow-ups, feel free to to continue the conversation in the chat box. Um, and another question asking to come back to the part about risk for vulnerable groups, uh, just saying that they have not fully understood where the risk is if many services are linked to the same identity. How do we perceive the risk of invasion of privacy if the identity is collected biometrically, for example? Right, so th those could be uh, the, I think the combination of many different questions, but uh, let me address the question around vulnerable groups. Uh, so the point we're making is that if a lot of services are linked to a single identifier and it is e and that identifier also provides information on particular racial groups or particular ethnic groups, then it essentially provides the government with a kill switch. Uh, that today I say, hey, uh, anyone who belongs to race one will not be able to access rations, will not be able to access uh, hospitals, will not be able to access education, etc. So it provides uh, the government a very real-time tool to actually deny uh, citizens what we believe are their fundamental rights. And therefore, uh, our preference always is uh, to for IDs which collect minimal data and certainly do not collect data which relates to race, race and ethnicity, etc. Uh, so that's uh, point one around how it increases vulnerability that it converts into a direct kill switch. Uh, second question that I picked up from that was around some of the privacy risks emanating from biometrics. Uh, and if, as I'm sure everyone on this uh, uh, discussion is familiar with the uh, is familiar with the enhanced risk of biometrics, the fact that uh, they cannot be changed once lost, uh, then there's a question of uh, bodily integrity. Uh, that uh, just collecting, forcibly collecting uh, parts of a human's body uh, is uh, somewhat uh, disempowering for individuals. Uh, from a privacy perspective, so creating centralized databases which have all this information, uh, if leaked, can cause very ir uh, irreversible damage uh, to individuals. So we recognize all of these heightened privacy risks that come due to biometrics. Uh, we also recognize that in many uh, uh, low income settings uh, and with uh, um, civil registries which are not very well developed where birth registrations are typically even low, uh, biometrics are often perceived as quicker ways to deduplicate a database and make sure there are no uh, uh, duplicate entries in a particular database. Um, and we believe therefore that uh, this there is a trade-off involved, uh, that biometrics do have a role to play but they come with very, very serious risks and therefore uh, we believe that the right design choices need to be made in order to minimize the privacy risks due to biometrics. And for example, one of the things we advocate is to you limit the use of biometrics only to deduplication, such that the first time you enter a database, you need to provide a biometrics. But for every repeat transaction, there are non-biometric ways of proving who you are, uh, which we believe are equally efficient. And I would just add to that too, and one of the questions too is that, you know, there's so there's many different types of um, IDs um, as well, and so I think a digital identity doesn't necessarily mean a, one a national ID, but when it is a national ID, you know, one of the areas that we really advocate is that um, it doesn't necessarily need to represent citizenship. Um, it could represent residency. And that can be a big distinction when you're talking about exclusion. And maybe that goes back to an earlier question around uh, documentation as well. In the sense is, are you a citizen of, of country X versus are you a resident or potentially have the, the right to, to be in that country? Um, and that distinction as well is, can be very important. Awesome. Um, if there are any further questions, please, this is your chance to, to use the chat function. Uh, I'm just going through and having a look and see if there's anyone that I've missed. Um, another question uh, here, speaking about um, ethics and around the discussion of good ID. Um, 
the participant knows that it's a it's a key concern in conversations around AI and how can and how that can be very dangerous when affected without ethics. Um, so yeah, how does how do ethics factor into discussion around good ID? Yeah, so I would say when we talk about um, good ID, and again, that's really a normative a framing of what an ideal ID. ID itself and ideal system would look like in the surrounding ecosystem. I mean, an ethical would be at the very heart um, of any ID. And, and part of that goes to is in the design. How is it designed in the sense of it's already it's designed to make sure that there's potential risks that could be mitigated in the future. Um, those are some of the key pieces. And it's again, ethical in the sense of thinking about it's very much built with um, the frame of being inclusive versus exclusive. And I would say again, really built with the frame of not just being uh, beneficial to the, the ID issuer, but most important, being of a value to the actual user. And I would even go farther. I mean, while I would say the word ethical is important, it's, it's also it's almost built with a human, uh, human rights lens, as I would even push it a little bit farther over ethical, is what we would consider to be a good ID. Yeah, and uh, what I would add to that is, uh, especially what we're seeing in the ethical AI discussion, uh, is that there's a risk that many uh, vested interests try to push ethics as a substitute for regulation, and we should be careful uh, not to allow that, uh, that I think there is a very definite role for uh, regulation, and those are the bare minimum things that safeguard our human rights should be enshrined in law. There's nothing, no principles, nothing uh, in that. It is basic law and basic rights that must be defended. Uh, the role that ethics play are in essentially uh, somewhat more subjective situations uh, or in somewhat more decentralized uh, forms of decision making. Um, and therefore, um, I think ethics has to be a component of the complete set of toolkits and guidelines that we look at. Uh, but in this case in particular, I, don't, I feel like we still haven't even cracked uh, the laws and regulations uh, set of issues. Uh, and therefore, ethics is something that we need to build on top of the laws and regulation rather than as a substitute. And I would say, I would echo that, and I would also say, I think a lot of times that's left out of the discussion or not as prominent as it should be, especially when you're talking about um, IDs, more of our, our data, so our, our de facto IDs. So the, you know, the, the data that's used online, and you're talking about AI, and that leads me to think of you know, different credit scoring. Um, a lot of that, um, there needs to be, there, there's, there's certainly a lot of conversation, but I would definitely echo um, Steve Ashish. I think it can, it's also very much based on, on context about what that means and who, you know, who also gets to decide what's ethical and what's not ethical as well. And so I think there, there is a key value in also having you know, policies and regulations as well to, to make sure that those stay in place. Awesome. Um, I'm gonna give participants one last chance to send through a question for discussion. Um, I don't know if there's any further points you, you or Subhashish would like to add here. Um, but uh, if there's no further questions, then uh, I guess you can hand over to you for a, a short wrap up. I think there's another question that just come in. I see so, yeah, so Winnis asks, uh, the focus has been, has been much directed on digital ID nowadays. Is the issue of acceptability or uh, applicability across border not a problem? How do, the, how do they overcome these challenges? Can you ask the question again? Sure, so the focus has been much directed on digital ID nowadays. Is the issue of applicability or acceptability across border not a problem? How do we overcome, how do people, how do governments overcome these challenges? Well, I mean, I think to some extent it goes back to a little bit to the, the last question. And a lot of that's depending on different on, on regulations. There's certainly quite a bit in motion now, you know, around uh, data flow across border, not only for individuals, but you know, also for for institutions and also for for you know the data Internet of Things as well. I think what I, I think moving forward, this is going to become more much more of an issue as well, um, and that's why you know there's such a push right now when you think about 
why why should a different um, IDs be digitized? And, and the argument that comes, you know, from the African Union or come from some of these larger institutions is just that, is that there's a much larger flow of, of not only people across borders, but as well of around uh, money across borders and things across border. So looking forward, there needs to be much more portability. But a lot of that really falls, you know, to regulations, but then also some of these more global norms. And I think, you know, th those are part of the larger discussions, you know, at, you know, events. You look at the G20, I mean, th that was the core of, of a lot of those discussions about what does that need to look like moving forward. And uh, for, for different governments, and I would say for many, you know, multilateral and, and larger international institutions, that's one of the reasons that they, um, feel that moving forward, especially different types of identities, especially national identities, should be digital. But again, it's, it's one of those things is that what would that look like in the sense of how would one be able to, to make sure that their data is protected when it leaves potentially the, the, the country or the, the state that it was, it was actually originally gathered? And the only thing I would add to that is very often, especially in the uh, kind of startup space, uh, a lot of them, a lot of the ideas we see are pitched as solving this using technology. But uh, the problem here is, of course, not one of technology. It's one about uh, regulation and acceptance of these ID credentials. Um, so uh, all the points that Thea laid out are the relevant ones. And I, I don't, technologically, this is, possibly a solved problem, uh, but we need to really uh, move the needle on convincing governments to be to uh, come on the common set of uh, legal uh, you know, acceptance levels that will help them accept these uh, ID credentials from country to country. I would say too, I mean, one more thing is that, you know, there's a lot of the discussions, especially when, when identities discussed, especially around them, self-asserted identities. Um, often the, the idea of the portability of, of data, you know, becomes one of the, the, the core reasons why, while that's deemed as important, which, you know, to some extent that we would agree with, but it's not necessarily something on a, a international scale. It's still very much um, limited to, to different countries and I think different geographies at this point in time. So there's certainly no lack of, of, of companies and, and, and startups that are looking specifically around portability, especially around different self-asserted identities. I mean, so going on that point, um, it was saying and speaking how that, you know, from a technological point of view, this is already perhaps a solved issue, uh, but the, the issue really lies in the hands of regulation. How much of a factor is the speed of passing those regulations and the discussion of those regulations uh, play a factor in the rollout of you know, digital ID or, or the or changing from a national ID to a digital ID, because uh, I just think from a South African point of view, from from in our context, you know, passing regulation is incredibly slow, um, and perhaps that's uh, a reason why I would consider that South Africa is behind the curve in terms of adopting these type of frameworks. Yeah, so very often, uh, you know, if you look at regulatory theory, all regulation doesn't need to go through parliament. Uh, some of the regulation is, of course, deferred regulation and depending from country to country, which IDs are acceptable or not is not necessarily something that needs to go through parliament. Uh, very often a central bank, for example, can, be, can allow that uh, with just a notification rather than uh, a regulatory process. Of course, uh, the speed at which these can be implemented will depend from country to country and depends on uh, how much of this is uh, you know, built into the law itself versus how much is delegated to regulatory authorities and can be changed via notifications, etc. Um, what we are encouraged by is the fact that now many collectives of countries are coming together to think about common uh, ID issuances and common standards. Uh, so we know in, uh, that there has been movement towards uh, mutual acceptance and interoperability in West Africa, in Southeast Asia, etc. Um, so, uh, very possibly these kind of moves are going to take us in the direction of uh, resolving uh, these kind of inter-boundary, uh, inter-country barriers that many migrants face. Uh, so, I think steps are encouraging. We need to expedite these issues. We need to uh, talk to these kind of collectives uh, like ECOVAS and ASEAN to actually uh, bring about these changes. Oh, great. Uh, thank you very much. I think, you know, from my side, and I'm sure for the audience, this has been very, very beneficial uh, and something that's been incredibly interesting. Um, I'm just going to wrap up with a, a short little thing from DFI here. Um, I'm going to share this here. So, 
Four things just as we're wrapping up. Uh, importantly, DFI and the and Emilio Network, we are awarding a city woman with the full scholarship opportunity to attend our four week digital identity course. Um, and this is an incredible opportunity for those of you in the chat who are who have not done this course, who are women in the sector who are looking to further your knowledge and further your, your skill sets. Um, there's a link that will be included with this PowerPoint that will be sent around to you where you can fill out your application form. So I encourage you, if you haven't already filled this out, to please go ahead and do it. The, the DAD course is an incredibly interesting one and one that has been quite popular over the last four runnings of the course. Um, another thing as well is that we have a professional LinkedIn group that uh, deals with uh, the League of Professionals in the digital financial sector. Uh, you can find this on the, this LinkedIn link in, in the PowerPoint. Uh, please, if you're not a member already, please join. Um, if you are a member, please feel free to post your thoughts, uh, your responses to this webinar, to any other webinar that we've done, and uh, be active on the group because this is where we really see the, the fruit of, of our engagement with you as, as, as students uh, and as, as people that deal with DFI. Um, if you want to see the webinar, if you want us to rewatch it, if you want to send it to a peer, you can see the recording at the link below under number three as well as any other webinar that we've done will be found here. Um, and they're quite a, a useful resource if you want to share with your community and your peers and uh, you may be perhaps missed one. And then finally, if, you're, if you have done the DAD course or you're not a woman and you can't uh, take, uh, I guess, uh, a proper, you, you, you can't f um, fill out the application form, there are an opportunity for you to uh, get a 50% discount on the, on the DID course or the Digital Humanitarian Payments course uh, by using the code WEBINAR50 when you're filling out your application uh, at digitalfrontiersinstitute.org. Uh, um, so please feel free to use that code if you, if you wish to receive a 50% discount on either of those two courses. Uh, and from my side, that's uh, that's all I need to say. Um, from Thea and Subashish, thank you so much. Is there anything you'd like to say before we uh, before we leave? Yeah, I would make a, a plug for uh, for all of the participants to join us uh, in the Good ID movement. Uh, that if you go on Twitter uh, and look for Good ID, or you go on GoodID.org, uh, you will find lots of material there about the Good ID movement. We look forward uh, to your inputs. Uh, please do participate, give comments, etc. Uh, and we'd love to uh, collaborate on how we actually move the needle on uh, some of these issues we're working on. Great, thank you so much. Thea, is there anything from your side? No, just would echo um, Subhashish. Please go to um, on Twitter and also online. And you can also look at our website, which is um, com. Well. Great, thank you so much. If there are any questions that come from this, uh, you can feel free to email um, Sarah at digitalfrontiersinstitute.org with any questions related to this and we can forward them on to our panelists and perhaps uh, to get the discussion uh, finalized. But other than that, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna be ending the recording now and uh, we'll see you around for the next webinar or perhaps on one of our courses and especially the discussion around good ID. Thank you very much.